Yes, and so um, first and foremost, uh, I'm a golden retriever enthusiast. That's like my real job. I spend the most amount of my time probably playing with my dog in my office because she's very <laughs> inspiring. And uh, then I obviously live with her as well. So that <clears throat> is probably my number one thing that I do. I'm a golden retriever enthusiast. I trained as a veterinarian at Ohio State and then went on and became a cardiologist um, at North Carolina State University. Got interested in heart disease and the genetics of that and went on to do my PhD with Dr. Mears in, in genetics of heart disease. And now I'm at UC Davis and I, I have a role on the advisory board of the Vet Genetics Laboratory, which some of you will be familiar with from submitting genetic tests um, that are currently available. So where is the intersection of genetics and cardiac disease? Um, well, we can take a look at human medicine and know that nowadays there are more than a thousand causative mutations that have been described leading to cardiac disease. We're actually really well over this number. I think the key word there is causative. There's about a thousand that appear to be really causative for disease and a couple thousand more that actually seem associated with disease. Those are generally in terms of heart muscle disorders or cardiomyopathies, congenital heart disease or birth defects, and then lastly, channelopathies, some of the diseases that are indicated in sudden death of people. But where does that come in in dogs? And so the genetic influence in dogs is generally seen, at least the first identification of genetic influence, is usually seen with breed specificity. So you guys have all seen indications of genetic disease across your different breeds. And that's where we take off into cardiac um, diseases. So there's at least a few thousand known inherited diseases in dogs and cats. In cardiac disease, we seem to be a bit further behind. So there are only four to six, depending on what ones you're looking at, um, mutations that are known to be associated with cardiac disease in the dog, although it seems that these numbers are increasing each year with new studies being funded and new information coming online. So in cardiac genetics, there will be shameless plugs of my dog in here because <laughs> I just had to put her somewhere and nobody really wants to see her. I try to show her in student lectures and I get in trouble for it all the time. So let's, let's first break down congenital versus acquired disease because I'm going to talk about a few different heart diseases today and I want to, want to get this out of the way because I hear this brought up as an argument that something is or isn't genetic all the time. And so congenital disease, meaning present from birth, acquired disease, meaning develops after birth, neither of which actually say whether or not it's genetic. Okay? Genetics can be the driving force for either of these categories. So as we move forward, I'm going to use the term inherited heart disease for cardiac diseases that have some evidence that they're passed on in families. So what are the types of inherited heart disease in dogs that you guys care about? Congenital disease is a huge category, the first of which is subaortic stenosis, my main area of interest, patent ductus arteriosus, pulmonic stenosis, tricuspid valve dysplasia. These are usually types of diseases that are involved in the kind of formation of heart valves and structure. And so these would be termed congenital heart diseases. And generally, we, we can see evidence of each of these being inherited in some of the different dog breeds. We're going to go into a couple of those in a bit. Acquired disease, these are the cardiomyopathies or heart muscle disorders that generally come on with age. Things like boxer cardiomyopathy or arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy dilated cardiomyopathy, or mitral valve degeneration, or endocardiosis. So you'll see these, people will think of these as age-related diseases, and sometimes use that as a, as a way to say that they don't believe that they're at least truly inherited. Um, I'm going to show you evidence to the contrary, I think. And so I'm just going to highlight some of the diseases that my lab works on here that we're going to go through, at least touch on, during this uh, next few slides. So we look at subaortic stenosis and pulmonic stenosis. I like valvular stenotic lesions. I think their development in the heart is really fascinating. Tricuspid valve dysplasia as well, something that we all know happens in Labrador retrievers a lot. Mitral valve degeneration, a huge problem. It's the only reason I really have a job at a vet school is because small dogs get valve disease and they need cardiologists for that. <laughs> so subvalvular aortic stenosis. This was the bulk of my PhD research and what my lab really continues to focus on 
think it's a really fascinating disease process and really devastating at times. Um, it's the second most common reported congenital heart disease in dogs, um, depending on what you read. Now, if you look at our caseload at UC Davis, it's actually the most common, um, but some of the data was really based on um, uh, pathology reports and things of that nature. So the really mild cases of subaortic stenosis may have been missed when we go back and look at the data there. Um, it's characterized by a subvalvular ridge of tissue beneath the aortic valve that really limits blood flow. And it's most common in large breed dogs, Newfoundlands, Rottweilers, Golden Retrievers, um, lots and lots of dog breeds get it, and we're gonna talk a little bit about some of those. The clinical signs of this disease and why I find it so fascinating are really different. So if they have mild subaortic stenosis, they can have absolutely no clinical consequence. And because of that, many of these dogs remain in the breeding population. Okay, and that's why subaortic stenosis has become such a common problem in my opinion. If they have severe disease, their average lifespan is just 19 months, and that's usually by way of sudden cardiac death, um, but they can also have complications like congestive heart failure. Now in humans, subaortic stenosis does exist. This, this isn't an isolated dog problem. It's just a lot more rare. So it was first described in people way back in 1842 in some uh, autopsy archives. And then it was first really drawn and published in 1924. This is a really beautiful representation of a subvalvular ridge. This is the left ventricle of a man, the aorta going out here. And then there's this abnormal ridge of tissue, very beautifully illustrated long before we actually had imaging into the heart that we use today. If you wanted to look at this in a dog, the image is actually remarkably similar. So I, this image is just taken on its side because this is really how we visualize hearts by echo or ultrasound. And so on the right side of the screen is the ultrasound image. This is the left atrium and mitral valve. This is the left ventricle, the main pumping chamber of the heart, and the aorta going out with the aortic valve leaflets here. And you see this very narrow pointy bit just below the valve. That's the subvalvular ridge or ring itself. And I've tried to position the actual heart in the exact same way to show you what it looks like in, in real life, or I guess in this case in real, real death. Um, this is the left ventricle and the left atrium with the mitral valve. Aorta is here. And then this is that subvalvular ridge or ring of tissue really dense fibrous connective tissue that limits the heart's ability to move blood forward. So diagnosis, we could certainly diagnose severe subaortic stenosis that looks like that on the pathology floor, and that is the gold standard, unfortunately, but we need an anti-mortem test for breed screening. And so in the 70s and 80s, the anti-mortem test was angiography, <clears throat> late 70s, early 80s, and kind of moving into the 90s. And so they would administer contrast and look at it um, with radiographs, either in sequence or in the kind of more modern era with fluoroscopy or moving x-ray. And now we actually have moved on to use ultrasound to look at the subvalvular region kind of in real time and watch blood flow out of the left ventricle. And so we use elevated aortic velocities and or the presence of this ridge as the way that we're going to diagnose subaortic stenosis. And so if you're a representative from a breed group that deals with subaortic stenosis, you're probably intimately familiar with the aortic velocity number. If you go see a cardiologist, you're probably saying, what's the velocity, what's the velocity? And that's really what we get hung up on for diagnosis of SAS, because the speed with which blood has to leave the left ventricle is really directly related to how narrow that outflow tract is. And so the more narrow the ridge or ring of tissue, the higher velocity the blood moves. And so severity of SAS over time has been really elaborately graded to give us mild, moderate, and severe disease categories. The mild, moderate, and severe disease categories haven't changed. So those have been the same long before I went to vet school. Um, but the equivocal and normal category is a moving target even within the time that I did my cardiology training. So if you've been in the breed long enough that you've been getting cardiac clearances, you might recognize that what's a passing score today would have been a failing score a decade ago. 
And that's really true and just reflects the knowledge that we're gaining in the breed-specific nature of this disease process. And we'll get to that in a second. But I will say, I, and I hedged on this on purpose because I don't want anybody to hold me to this, but equivocal disease category in general is between two and two and a half meters per second. So that means we don't know whether your dog has subaortic stenosis or whether it's normal. And that's a really frustrating disease category. It's, I'm sure, incredibly frustrating for you. Um, it's equally frustrating for us. I mean, if you go to school all the time that it takes to be a veterinarian and then a cardiologist and then you study this disease, the last thing you want to do is mark down a form that says, I have no idea whether your dog has it or not. <laughs> I assure you that is frustrating. And, and so we are working diligently to figure out if we can better classify those equivocal dogs. What we know is that above two and a half meters per second, we call you affected with subaortic stenosis. That's pretty standard across the world of cardiology, up to three and a half, because that equates to a pressure gradient that's elevated at 25 to 50. Moderate subaortic stenosis, we say three and a half to four and a half meters per second. And severe, we say greater than four and a half meters per second of blood speed. And this is really the important category because this is the category that carries with it the really severe consequence in terms of disease. Okay, so these are the dogs that have the average lifespan of just 19 months. Now, there are a lot of dogs that exceed that, obviously, that's just a median survival time. But there are also dogs that die really suddenly quite early in life. And so we, we have no way of predicting what way they're going to go. Laminar versus turbulent blood flow is another real indication of disease versus normal status. And so when we're thinking about equivocal dogs, dogs that have a slightly elevated velocity, but we're not sure whether it's disease or not, you'll often hear cardiologists throw around the term, well, was the blood flow laminar or was it turbulent? And what that means is, <clears throat> is this dog just excited and actually really working, improving cardiac output, but in a normal way? laminar blood flow, like this free-flowing fluid from the end of a garden hose? Or is it turbulent? Is there something obstructing blood flow, making blood go in many different directions, and changing the appearance of that blood flow on what would be called color Doppler for the echocardiogram? And so this is a very important way that we sometimes try to sort out equivocal um, disease status in dogs. This is a still image of a Six and a half year old male peanut butter terrier, I don't know, pit bull maybe. It has two M's and a PB. I, I'm gonna say that a resident labeled this slide so that I'm not guilty. But this is a dog with severe subaortic stenosis. And so this is a view, the subcostal view. So if you've ever had a dog screened for subaortic stenosis, you'll see your cardiologist hopefully strain to really get that probe up into the abdomen below the diaphragm to align perfectly with blood flow, because the best assessment of blood flow is when you're absolutely parallel. And so this is the diaphragm here, the liver, this is the gallbladder. Not interested in that. We're going down below into the left ventricle. And this is the aorta with the aortic valve here. And you see this very tight, narrowed, almost tunnel-like lesion in this dog, creating the subaortic stenosis. Okay, you can imagine that that dramatically increases the pressure that the left ventricle has to generate to move blood forward. And so <clears throat> you can see how much information we get out of the echocardiogram. And for that reason, I'm going to make the, the plea that auscultation really for subaortic stenosis is not good enough. So if you're in the, of the mindset that auscultation rules out subaortic stenosis, I'm, I'm here to tell you it doesn't. Um, unfortunately, many, many, many of the dogs that are at high risk for subaortic stenosis are also wonderfully excited with life, full of energy animals. And so golden retrievers, for example, almost all of them have a heart murmur when they get excited. Okay? When I started training for cardiology or, or vet school, there was a cardiologist at Ohio State that would take golden retrievers in and listen to them. And then she'd run them down the hallway and she'd listen to them again. And she would send golden retriever breeders home crying by the truckloads because they all had heart murmurs. And I actually remember I used to volunteer to kennel and, and, and that's where I really found my love for golden retrievers. I remember riding home from, from Ohio State before I ever went to vet school and hearing, 
that doctor just hears things. She's making things up because they, she says every dog has a heart murmur. Well, she's not making things up. They all do have a heart murmur, almost. Okay. So if you just listen to resting golden retrievers, more than half of them will have a heart murmur. If your person that listens to your golden retrievers isn't hearing a heart murmur in 50% of them, you either need to close the dog's mouth or clean their stethoscope. That is the rule. Okay. Boxers, more than 80%. We go to the Boxer Dog Show every year and do auscultations. And every year I explain eight out of ten times that a murmur means nothing and that the echo is going to tell us whether it's important because almost all the boxers have murmurs. Doppler echo is really the only way that we can decide if a dog that has a soft murmur is truly normal. Another important point, you can't overestimate velocity. So when you go see a cardiologist and they give you a four meter per second reading, you don't need to go see another cardiologist. That guy didn't do anything wrong. Your dog is at normal, okay? And that's really hard to hear and might not be the rule when we're talking about excited equivocal dogs, but when we're talking about clearly affected dogs, there's nothing that you can do on your ultrasound probe to overestimate velocity. Now you can really underestimate it. So if you do a bad job with alignment or um, you're not really taking the appropriate view for your aortic velocity, you can really underestimate it. And so a lot of dogs are clear with a sloppy screening that would fail with a more diligent screening. I would say an abnormal result in any dog at rest should be taken really seriously with this disease. And lastly, one more time, unfortunately, clear by auscultation alone in breeds at risk for subaortic stenosis just doesn't mean much to me. So what is a normal aortic velocity? Well, that's a really great question, and it matters from a lot of standpoints. So breed, breed matters. Boxer dogs have normally higher aortic velocities than Newfoundlands, okay? It's just the way it goes. They both get SAS. And so when you're a cardiologist clearing these dogs, you're probably not using the same clearance scale. So if you're one of those people that breeds multiple dog breeds and you happen to be the unlucky Newfoundland and boxer enthusiast, you're going to have to memorize two scales. The cardiologist, it's gonna matter what cardiologist you see. Some cardiologists that were trained 30 years ago that are still out there doing breed screenings might use the scale that they used 30 years ago. And they might fail a lot of dogs that would otherwise be cleared by other screening techniques. Demeanor, how excited is your dog? That's really gonna matter, okay? Lots of young, excited dogs, especially screened at dog shows, get put up on a table and get a quick examination. Those dogs are sympathetically driven. They're excited and ready to go, and that's gonna improve their cardiac output. Okay, so their velocity is gonna be higher. If they measure normal at a dog show, that's great. They're very normal, they'll always be normal. But if they measure abnormal and just slightly abnormal, those are dogs that I actually would retest in a different environment. And you probably won't do yourself any favors by going into your new cardiologist that's gonna do your retest and pretending like this never happened so if you just sneak in and, and try not to tell them that your dog maybe failed before, they're not going to go out of their way to make it this soothing, calm environment, you know, light the incense and start the massage that they need to do to really get a good estimate of aortic velocity. So really, I, I would encourage you, if you have a, an equivocal dog, that you go to see a cardiologist with an upfront request to try and make it as calm as possible. And last, the decade. I mean, I think things have changed in subaortic stenosis screening um, a lot over time, and, and they're changing even more as we move forward. Now, the problem is, as a group of cardiologists, we are not moving forward very quickly. We are lagging behind because it requires all of us to get in a room and agree on something, which you can imagine is really, really challenging. And so you have to, you know, when you go out and you do breed screenings uh, for your dogs, I would really figure out who you want to go see and where their experience lies in terms of subaortic stenosis. Because if they use that 1999 scale of 1.8, then 90% of your dogs are gonna fail, okay? So here's just an example of how echo technique really changes it. 
comparison of Doppler-derived aortic velocities obtained from various transducer sites. So where you put your probe actually matters. This, this study actually found they could get 1.46 compared to 1.1 for a velocity in dogs just based on the way that they did the screening. And so if you thought that, you know, an equivocal to an affected matter, then 0.3 meters per second really matters to you. And you want to use a cardiologist that's using the same scale all the time. What this means mostly is that dogs get inappropriately called normal because the subcostal site is the accurate one and the left apical site is not. Now, both of these are, are known methods for screening for subaortic stenosis. But if you had a dog that was 2.5 and you took it and you did a left apical view, you could make that dog equivocal. Or if you had a, a high equivocal dog, you could make it clearly normal just by changing your transducer site. And so we're really looking at, at subaortic stenosis. When we look at these dogs for studies, we insist that they be subcostally obtained aortic velocities. And there's a little box for that on your OFA forms when you submit it where your cardiologist obtained that sample. Treatment for subaortic stenosis, this is why this is such a bad disease. No interventional therapy to date changes the clinical outcome. Now, if you've been following subaortic stenosis, there's some new interventional techniques on the horizon. People are using these things called cutting balloons, followed by high pressure balloon valvuloplasty to stretch out that dense fibrous ring. And they're having good success at alleviating clinical signs of disease at the time. Unfortunately, the long-term follow-up data isn't there yet. And I'm actually hesitant to believe that it's going to be any better than what we've known before about this disease. In, in children with this condition, if they go in and physically remove the subaortic ridge, the outcome doesn't change. So getting rid of the pressure doesn't seem to be the whole story. There's something more globally going on in these hearts than just a pressure overload. Syncope, sudden death, and congestive heart failure are the three things that we worry about and watch for, but what we'd really like to be able to do is prevent these dogs from being produced in the first place. From a genetic background study standpoint, in 1976, Dr. Patterson really pioneered the way in Newfoundland dogs and showed this to be an autosomal dominant disease with what he called incomplete penetrance, meaning not everybody got it that he expected to get the disease or potentially polygenic and, and more complex than he thought. We've shown that it's familial in golden retrievers and rottweilers, and I'll show you some data in Newfoundlands coming up, and we know it's really rare in people. This is a Newfoundland pedigree. It just, I just want to show you how incredibly easy it is for this disease to be propagated along disease lines. And so what you can see are the, the boxes that are shaded with the lines, those are dogs that are in the equivocal category, okay? Those that are black are clearly affected by Doppler scale. Those that are white or open are unaffected or normal by Doppler. Those are the question mark we weren't able to screen directly. And so what you can see here is that it would appear that one equivocal dog, a dog that had not a very severe aortic velocity at all, propagated a whole lot of progeny with severe subaortic stenosis one of which even resulted in sudden death in a young puppy. And so this is a bad disease once it really takes hold in a breed. And unfortunately, because it will show up as either equivocal or mild really frequently, it gets perpetuated really, really easily. So this is just one extended family of Newfoundlands. So from a research prog progress perspective, we start all the way back in 1976 with Dr. Pyle, showing SAS in Newfoundland as being inherited. <clears throat> in 1998, Dr. Lemke and Muir's of Ohio State took on a study looking to see uh, if they could work on the genetics of this disease. And then they went on to work with these dogs as far as therapeutic options. And they showed that it didn't really matter what they did, if they used a beta blocker drug or if they used a balloon, those dogs still only got an average lifespan of four and a half years. So really kind of nailing it down that this is a bad disease when you have severe disease no matter what we try. Um, in 2012, this is when that new technique came on the market as an option to palliate uh, clinical signs of disease, but maybe not change outcome. 
In 2012, this is when Dr. Um, Muir's lab and, and our group um, at North Carolina at the time really worked on publishing some genome-wide association work in this disease, which I'll show you. And then in 2013 and 14, we did release a mutation that we found in Newfoundland dogs that's associated with disease. Um, but I'm going to show you where that falls in terms of explaining only a portion of their story. And so this is the mutation that we identified in Newfoundland dogs. It's in a protein called PCOM. Um, it's an insertion mutation, so normal dogs don't have it. Affected dogs have it. Um, and what this uh, mutation really does uh, is change our protein conformation in a protein that's really important in recycling things at the cell membrane. And so it, it's been associated before with plaque formation in the brain in Alzheimer patients. It's been associated with some other kind of plaque-like lesions. And what we're looking at it in is this kind of plaque-like subvalvular ridge or ring. Now, the statistics of it in our population were pretty good. So we had dogs from all over the United States. We did not have any international dogs. And when we used all of our dogs, not including that giant family that I showed you, because we didn't want to increase statistics based on that one huge family, um, we found that we increased the odds ratio of finding subaortic stenosis by 70 times. That was pretty good, but when you really get down to the nitty gritty of the mutation, what you see is that there are a couple problem areas. And that is that normal dogs occasionally, um, <coughs> sorry, normal dogs, occasionally show up with the genotype, okay? And that dogs that are affected by subaortic stenosis occasionally don't have the genotype. It's pretty infrequent in this population, but it left room for us to think that there's at least something else going on here, something else involved in the development of subaortic stenosis, at least in Newfoundland, that we really need to look at. Now, when we look at PCOM and its role in how the subaortic stenosis develops, we look at the outflow track in developing, um, these are uh, frog embryos, so not really my area of expertise in terms of clinical evaluation, but this is the developmental outflow track, what would be the aorta in frog, essentially. And if you look, what normal looks like is developing this nice open area here that's gonna become a tube. And when you inhibit this protein partially, you end up with collapse of that region where the outflow tract should develop. So there's something going on with cardiac morphogenesis and the development of the outflow tract in, in terms of this gene. So where are we now? Uh, well, we've looked at a lot of breeds of subaortic stenosis. Golden retrievers, we've identified a chromosomal region of interest based on, gen on genome-wide association study much of the same thing that uh, Dr. Simpson just showed you guys. And we're in the process of working on whole genome sequencing. We need to get some um, more samples kind of queued up for whole genome sequencing in this group. Rottweilers, same story. We're right there ready to move forward with whole genome sequencing. Newfoundlands, actually we've taken those dogs, the Newfoundlands that are affected with subaortic stenosis and don't have PCOM, and we've put those on for whole genome sequencing to see what they have going on that's distinctly different than our other population. Dog de Bordeaux, actually they have a problem with subaortic stenosis, and, and we've mapped that, but we'd like to add some more dogs to that study. Bull Mastiffs, we're in the process of collecting. Bouviers, we need to continue collecting. And Bull Terriers, we need to continue collecting. But what you can see is this disease really affects a really wide variety of dogs. Um, and, and we're really working hard to figure out if we can either identify breeds that share some traits that have SAS, or if these are really all going to be private mutations in these breeds. So I want to switch for just a minute and talk about acquired heart disease, because I don't want everybody to feel left out that doesn't have a big sporting breed dog in the room. And so these are inherited diseases, but not considered congenital. Myxomatous mitral valve degeneration, or MMVD, as it's abbreviated in the literature, also known as mitral valve endocardiosis, uh, also sometimes just shortened to, shortened to mitral valve degeneration, has a similar human counterpart called mitral valve prolapse, but not exactly the same. 
This is that degenerative valve disease leading to incompetency of the valve, leading to left atrial enlargement. And then instead of pressure overload, we get a volume overload and congestive heart failure. So if you are a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel enthusiast, you know all about this disease. In that breed, there are more affected dogs than normal dogs. I actually started out with the desire to study this disease in Cavaliers, and I've almost given up because it's been, I think, six or seven years that I've been trying to collect samples, and I have three normal dogs, three. And I've collected, I think, 400 affected dogs. So, and that's just in full screenings. I just can't find a normal Cavalier. So if you have one on your couch, you should let me know. What age? Yes, exactly, that's the question. So what age is normal? Well, we need to know that these guys aren't going to go on and develop it if we want to consider them a typical control. So 10 years, 12 years, I don't know. I actually started lowering the age over time. So when I started out, I was really aggressive. I thought, I want these dogs to be 12 years old and not have mitral valve degeneration because cabbies live a good long time if they don't die of heart failure. And so um, I thought that would be reasonable. No, couldn't find any 12s. I think the three or so that I have are about 10. Um, and if I drop that down to seven, I can get a lot more. But the question becomes, what are we actually looking for if we start allowing our controls to be younger and younger? And so I'm gonna show you what I think we're looking for. And so whippets are where we went next. Um, so, do we have any Whippet folks in the room? Yes, great. So Whippets are where we went, went, went next for mitral valve disease. Because Whippets are unique. They're not your typical small breed dog. They get this small breed dog disease, but they're not as ubiquitously affected as the Cavalier. And so we thought in Whippets we could actually really clearly define a control population. And there happened to be a really nice longitudinal clinical investigation ongoing in Whippets at the time. And so, just to show you what mitral valve disease looks like, in case you've not actually been up close and personal with it, this is a very expertly dissected normal mitral valve where the leaflet of the valve itself should be paper thin. And then as disease sets in and it moves forward, you see that leaflet start to balloon up, get thicker in its appearance, and in the end stage, it actually rolls up on the edges. And you can imagine this valve, which is supposed to close and keep blood from moving across it, no longer works at all. And so it's an expansion of the spongiosa layer of that valve with glycosaminoglycans and proteoglycan material, okay? Causing those leaflets to roll. It can spread down to affect the support apparatus of the valve, or the chordae tendinae, these little strings here, can also become affected. The valve then prolapses back into the left atrium and allows blood to leak. Those chordae tendinae can get so irritated that they rupture. And eventually, you end up with massive amounts of retained blood within the left side of the heart, causing bad, bad, bad congestive heart failure. And so mitral valve degeneration is a super common disease process in what I like to call one-handed dogs. You can pick them up and put them on the table with one hand. They pretty much all get some form of mitral valve degeneration with age, okay? But particularly, the Cavalier and other breeds like the Whippet are really overrepresented. And so in Whippets, <coughs> this is just a, a graphical uh, depiction here, an echo of a dog with mitral valve degeneration. This is not supposed to look like this. So this is the mitral valve, and it is amazingly thick. So you can imagine that that valve is no longer competent, and it's really just letting lots and lots of blood leak back into this left atrium. So again, this valve here allowing blood to regurgitate across the valve, causing a heart murmur, eventually leading to congestive heart failure. So we consider this a challenging disease because maybe this is just a fixed trait in the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. So maybe my efforts to identify the normal Cavalier is you know, uh, something I should give up on. I'm still trying a little bit. But uh, I think it's really difficult to find a truly normal Cavalier, especially deciding what normal age is going to be there. Um, <clears throat> screening for this disease also makes it incredibly challenging. If, if you want to feel bad for somebody, subaortic stenosis people, you should feel bad for the mitral valve degeneration people because they have to screen every year by echo and they don't really know when to stop screening. 
right? So while subaortic stenosis, you can screen once at about a year of age with echo and you're good to go, mitral valve degeneration is an adult onset disease. We just don't know when you can stop screening to say that your dog isn't going to develop it. And so that left us wondering if studying the severity of the disease was more reasonable. And that's how, how we ended up in whippets. What we find in the whippet is that there's a subpopulation of whippets that end up with mitral valve disease really early and more severe than other whippets. And so the question became, do we really care if a 12-year-old dog has a little bit of valve degeneration? Or are we really worrying about those five-year-old whippets that are no longer able to do what they are supposed to be doing, no longer able to live a normal dog life because they have really bad heart disease? And so it became kind of a natural fit for us to say, well, really, disease severity is what we're most interested in. And so we took a different approach in the whippet. So we looked for genetic markers associated with early disease onset, developing a disease severity score. And this is a very similar plot. This is a Manhattan plot of a genome-wide association study. And what you see is that there's clearly, since we went through this last, last hour with Dr. Simpson, there's clearly a big peak in the middle here that likely represents a, a genome association to this disease severity of mitral valve disease. And this is where we're now working and organizing our efforts to see if we can figure out what makes some whippets have this disease early and then potentially give us a target, either something that we can go in to treat or something that we can genetically test for. And so um, that's kind of our new information in whippets that's got us really excited to finally have something to grasp onto relative to mitral valve degeneration. Um, it kind of is worth pointing out that mitral valve degeneration has been studied in this way in Cavaliers multiple times with variable results, and none of them have generated an association that would be anywhere near this strong. And so we're hopeful that what we're finding is something that we can work with from a disease pathogenesis standpoint that might even more broadly apply to breeds other than just the whippet. And so that's where we are now with whippets. We're working um, under AKC funding to support whole genome sequencing in a bunch of whippets to look for whatever that is um, on that chromosome that's making them have more early onset disease. In the Cavalier, we've kind of stalled our progress here. We need, to, we need to develop a new mission for the Cavalier. And I think it might be possible that we could develop the mission similar to that of the whippet. Um, but since the whippet progress is moving so fast, I thought maybe we ought to see what we find in the Whippet and see if it applies to the Cavalier and save everybody the effort and the funding for this time being, because we'll have that kind of Whippet data um, buttoned down here in the next year. I want to make sure that I left plenty of time for questions um, relative to disease screening. I acknowledge that uh, the AKC and all the breed groups have been incredible in their support of our programs. Um, at every institution I've been at so far, and that certainly continues at UC Davis, where I am now. This, I mean, this is just ridiculous, I think. <laughs> <laughs> this, the cat actually likes it, though. I don't, this is not animal cruelty. This is a repeat thing. Um, and then I'll take any questions you have. Thank you, Dr. Strange. I just want to have a comment more yes. than a question. And that is, I absolutely loved it that you came out and said auscultation is not enough. Because in my breed, which is German children and pointers, um, we keep getting uh, feedback from our membership that when they take their puppies in to be screened, and this is a chick requirement for us, that the cardiologists all tell them, oh yes, we can hear a murmur, and you know, if we don't think it's serious, it'll be okay, you know, we'll pass you, and but you know, you don't need an ultrasound. Yeah. And we have struggled with this because we don't feel we can get the support of the cardiology community. Uh, unlike you, I mean, you are the first cardiologist that I have heard say, you know, out publicly that this is not enough. And, 
where is that thinking in the cardiology community? <laughs> Great. Uh, good, really, really good questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I, I think there are a couple things at play here. One is that um, certainly cardiologists are uh, you know, good at their job, I think. Uh, at least I like to think when I go to work that we're good at our jobs. And, and so we are, we're, we're a group that believes that if a murmur is there, we should be able to hear it, which I absolutely agree with. What I don't agree on is that when you take a cardiologist out of our little room in our teaching hospital, in, in my example, where I can tell everybody adamantly to shut up and close all doors and turn off all machines, and you put me at a state fair next to the bathroom <laughs> with a thousand things going on that I'm gonna have the same sensitivity and specificity that I had in my home office. So that's one thing that I think is really important. And, and I will tell you, you've, you've hit the nail on the head that cardiology is divided down the middle, I think. I don't think I'm the only one, thank goodness. Um, divided down the middle between those that believe that echo is really a key component of breed screenings and those that would rather not do echo as a component of breed screenings. I do not know what the real motivation is on the other side of the fence because I'm not on that side of the fence. But I would say that I think, um, I think it's changing. I think what we're showing is that, uh, you know, if you listen long enough and if dogs are excited, lots of dogs have murmurs. And a lot of the dogs that you think didn't have a murmur have a good reason to have a murmur when you put them on the echo table. I'll use Newfoundlands as an example. Um, the last time I did a Newfoundland screening event, uh, there were a lot of dogs that I didn't hear a heart murmur on, and when I got them on the table, they had clear echo evidence to have a heart murmur. And you know, nothing makes you less confident in your cardiologist than when they put your dog on the table, they say, oh, there's something wrong, let me listen again when they get off the table. <laughs> I mean, that's a bad thing, right? But those are giant, hairy, panting beasts of wonderful nice dogs. But they're, they're a cardiologist nightmare. And so really auscultation-based screening is just not enough. I, I completely stand by that. And we're in the process of reforming as a group of cardiologists working really diligently with the OFA to reform our screening forms. And I think the reform of screening practices is going to go along with that. One of my favorite cardiologists says, you know, I get asked to do so many breed screening clinics these days. Uh, it's, it's incredible. And I said, well, why do you think that is? says, it's because I'm old and I can't hear anymore. <laughs> and so it all comes down to what you actually want to find as well. So. Could you comment, please, on dogs like the American Staffordshire, which tend to have these huge hearts and so on, and like you mentioned how they change the velocity yeah. Over the years, because I had one like 15 years ago that we neutered because he had like a 1.8 or 1.9, and now you know the velocity is higher, and they very often seem to have soft murmurs, which I'm told are just because of the huge. That's right. So, part. so functional murmurs in athletic dogs are incredibly common. Mildly elevated aortic velocities relative to what we thought was normal 10 years ago are incredibly common. And what's really, really needed are breed-specific reference ranges that every cardiologist has access to in a very convenient, very centralized location. I think that that is a pipe dream, to be honest with you. I think, you know, to get all of these to be quite honest, really boring studies completed where you look at 100 of each breed and determine what a normal number is. I mean, that is nobody's dream research project, right? It's just really hard to come by. And so I think you have to find uh, somebody who's enthusiastic about a specific disease in your breed and go after organizing that number for your group if you think your group falls outside of normal. I think boxers have done it well, so if you want a model of somebody that's done it well, boxers have done it well. They, they figured out that their group is different and uh, they get us there and we do screenings every year and they get the same people back. I don't think they've done it well because they got me, but I think they've done it well because they get the same people back every year who continue to try and educate the group from the ground up 
about the fact that, hey, if you go see a cardiologist that doesn't see boxers all the time and you get a 2.2, don't go home and spay it, okay? Go talk to your friends, that's not a big deal, right? And that's a, that's a big difference um, compared to what, what we used to think. And so your, your breed absolutely uh, is gonna be different. Athletic, strong, really high levels of cardiac output, just change velocity. My question relates to all breed clusters that tend to have wellness screening at their clusters. Uh, my all breed panel club does do that, but the cardiologists we have that come, come with Dopplers with them. Yes. And there's a separate quiet room where the dogs can go wow. to be screened further. Yes. Would your statement be that that should be the gold standard for all these clubs that are in this room? That rather than doing a meaningless auscultation, if they're going to offer a clinic, they should offer a meaningful one? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. I think um, auscultation only clinics have a place in that they're easily accessible and uh, they can get a lot of dogs looked at really, really fast. And you know, you're not going to, to inappropriately classify a ton of dogs with auscultation only, but certainly Doppler-based clinics are a huge step up. And I think more and more breed groups that have problems that require congenital heart screenings are figuring that out and bringing people out that bring an echo machine with them. Don't get me wrong, it is a giant pain to go somewhere off-site with my echo machine, fly it across the country, and do a big breed screening. It is, it is a pain. And you know, you, you do it in a short amount of time with limited amount of help for a very reduced price. And so I understand that there are a lot of people who resist offering that service, one, and groups that resist offering organizing that service. But I do think it's where we're going if you want to truly say that you're working on eliminating something like subaortic stenosis and certainly other diseases. I mean, don't even go into the other diseases. They're even worse, right? Dilated cardiomyopathy, mitral valve, uh, stenosis, tricuspid valve dysplasia. There's no chance of screening those without an echo. Yeah, I really, I, I'm a general practitioner. <clears throat> what I tell my people is that, that you don't test to pass. You're testing to try to find out if you have a problem. And that really, I think, is the thing that underlines many of the problems that breed clubs have, is that individuals within the club are working their ass off trying to pass. <laughs> right. Whether you're taking x-rays of elbows or hips, or listening to hearts or looking at eyes. You know, you really don't want to... Uh, pass at the expense of perpetuating the problem. Yeah, absolutely. It is, it is absolutely a paradigm shift that we have to deal with and figure out how to get the information out there so that people do it right. I would say um, the other last comment I want to make, I just thought about, is uh, when we're talking about subaortic stenosis and aortic velocities, there is, if, if you get called normal by your cardiologist, there's no better than that. Okay, so, so don't don't even try to be the person that says, I got a 1.9, I'm better than your 1.95, or I got a 1.7 and I want to breed to a 1.5 because my puppies are going to be 1.6. It does not, it does not work that way. And people celebrate those scores like crazy. I mean, I think this year at the Boxer Show we gave away a, a 1.65 or something, and, I, you know, I could have charged triple for that number, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's an amazing thing. Normal, normal is normal, and you should be really seeking to identify abnormalities and help better the breed with these screening practices. That's the key. Thank you so much, Dr. Stern. Thanks.